So one other business belters, another day, another dollar. And today we're actually talking about pricing, how to set your price, how to, when you start a company, how do you work out what your hourly rate is, your day rate, your packages, how do you come up with those kind of numbers. I speak to a lot of people where I go, right, how did you come by these numbers? Or it seems mm. quite different the way you price to what I'm used to seeing in the industry. So I thought it'd be a good topic for us to talk about and really pull out one, how we set the prices, but also maybe how we've seen prices getting set by other companies and mm -hmm. talk about some of the different methods that people use. Yeah. Do you want to start us off, Mark? Absolutely. Um, I actually think it's, again, another great topic and it's something I've probably seen quite a lot where people don't get their pricing right. Um, I was actually, funnily enough, talking to somebody else that's in business and we were just kind of sitting um, having like, lunch and they were chatting away and they say, they, they admitted, they says, I'm not making enough money because I'm not pricing properly. And the products that they're, they're making are fantastic. So they're, they're not really getting the value for what, what they're getting. And it's just, I'm not sure what the problem is when people set their price. If it's a knowledge thing, if it's a anxiety thing, but they don't think that they're good enough, that they shouldn't be pricing high enough. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think ultimately, like, it's about, I feel it's about a sort of knowledge and actually understanding um, how to price properly um, and what you should actually be pricing for. Um, so, you you know, you're pricing on the cost of your goods or your staff and then what's the markup on that? Or are you doing like a value-based pricing? Um, so, like, what is the value that somebody would actually pay for? Um, so, yeah, I mean, how did you set your price? Because I know you, you're, you're quite good with pricing as well. Yeah, to build on it. Um, so, what I've done is... I actually took market research in the sense of what's the average. Mm -hmm. So when I done my research, the average price per hour for agencies was eighty nine pounds plus fat. Right. That was standard. Um, so I used to go in at ninety pounds plus fat. But I, I actually done like a kind of tiered system. So what I tried to do is, I believe in not discounting, but basically incentivizing customers to do what I want them to do. Yeah. Um, so what I said is like, if you want to do pay as you go, we're going to be a hundred and twenty pounds per hour. Oh, sorry, actually, it was 140. So 140, I don't actually do it that often, you can tell that. <laughs> but I've done 140 an hour for pay as you go. With the idea of, like, I don't really want to do pay as you go because it's, like, ad hoc work and, you know, it's going to be, like, more difficult. The guys won't be as familiar with your client work. It's going to take us longer to kind of work things out. Um, if you're on prepaid, like a bank of time, like a top-up card, we'll drop down to 110 per hour. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a retainer, we'll give you it for £90 per hour. So for all intents and purposes, our rate is £90 per hour, but you can see what I've done there. So the type of work I don't want is the highest rate to put them off of it. Prepaids are probably like the middle ground, which is kind of good for us, good for the client, but still not quite ideal because it's not recurring revenue. And then the best is retainer, so it's £90. Mm -hmm. Now when I'm selling that, I'm saying like, you know, the UK average is 89 I'm sure you won't kind of be annoyed at me for rounding it up by a quid um, mm -hmm. and the client would generally laugh because it's fair you know if 89 yeah. is the average and one pound more than the average but I've actually seen other agencies and I won't name anyone but I've seen other agencies where they're actually taking in the aggregate of how much they pay resources in India mm -hmm. and they're saying right this is the international average which will pull your pricing down to around about 40 or 45 per hour something like that yeah um, and that's dangerous because I don't think that they are factoring in all the costs. Mm -hmm. So like I've sat with agency owners and I've broke it down and said, right, how much is your resources costing? You're like, well, I don't know how to work that out. And you go, well, take all your salaries, work out their hourly rate, add them all together and divide it by the amount of staff that you worked out against, including yourself. And then that's going to give you an average. So I think we were at £23.08 uh -huh. was how much we were paying per hour on a, a, as an average, an average rate. And then I'm thinking, yeah, but the studio costs three and a half thousand pounds and the equipment and the licenses and all the testing equipment and, you know, depending on how intensive your project process is, yep. then it has a lot of cost. Um, browser stack, 300 quid a year. Envision, you know, 274 a year. Yeah. Uh, Zoom, like all these kind of tools, Asana, Zendesk, ticketing systems, Jira, all mm -hmm. this stuff adds up. Um, don't I know it? Because <laughs> when you look at your running costs, you go, how can it be that? That's ridiculous. But all these SaaS services have a cost. So they need to be factored in. So mm -hmm. you need to look at it and say, right, how many jobs am I going to do in a month? Let's say I do 30 pieces of work. So 30 pieces of work need to divide in that running cost mm -hmm. or probably like, you know, even go higher than that and say, right, 
imagine there was only 10 pieces of work because yeah. you need to add that on. So I think when you factor it in like that, most people will try and aim for about 20% or 30% net if they mm -hmm. can get it, mm -hmm. knowing full well that if there's a couple of mistakes or little things that happen in the project, it'll erode the price. And I think that's something that both clients and agency owners don't think about is, yeah. let's say I say to you, this is going to take 10 hours. Now, some people don't quote on time, they quote on the project. But if I know it's going to take 10 hours and then it takes, say, 15 hours, mm -hmm. I've just took a 50% haircut in whatever margin I was making because that time is now elastically covered longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm making less on the resources. So what might have been 20% profit all day long, happy mm -hmm. days, when you actually look at it in reality, maybe we made 7%. Yeah. Maybe we even took a loss. Yeah. You know, we could talk about that, like where it's like a when's a good time to go, that type of work isn't profitable for you. us, even though it looks like it is for the outside because it's a big... Yeah. Headline figure. What about you? How did you that, come up with your price? Yeah, I was just going to say, but that, that's knowing your pricing, isn't it? When you know the things, that you, the job's actually going to run out, run out of money. Like, well, you're, you're basically getting I scope know, creep. I know, now you're basically paying for the client to get it. Um, I probably, I, I took learnings of pricing. When I initially started out, I took learnings of pricing from um, other organisations that I'd worked with and other agencies, so saw their price, but didn't really fully understand like how they got to that price. But you know, this is the thing like the marketing agency world, you can have people, you know, you can hire people like at Fiverr.com for like, you know, 10 pound an hour, but then you can have like big agencies like, you know, 150, 200 pound an hour. So there's like a vast difference of where the pricing is. So as, you know, a Joe Public, what do they think that they're getting? What's the difference in the perception of I the perceive price? Value the perceived everything. value of the pricing. But when I started, well, I was one man band, so I can't really do that. Um, so I was, I remember going in, it was quite high, and then lots of people were kind of going, well, you're just on your own, and I can know that you're just on your own. So then I was like, oh, I'll go down in price, and I'll go down in price. And, but it was frustrating me, it was really frustrating me to understand why, like, I need to get the pricing part, point right. It's really, really important in business. And I went and started off with a sort of rule of thirds uh, idea. So basically, like, if I was to take a £50,000 salary, then what would that £50,000 salary be per hour? And then I would actually add on, um, you know, a third for cost, cost yeah. and a third for, for markup to then go, that, that's what I should actually be, be charging. So I then went on, I went on that uh, route of things. I've now sort of built, um, because I was working with a, another organisation, with a software company, and they gave me a spreadsheet of like how marketing agencies should like charge it was such a good resource and I now literally can just like type in so see if I was getting a new employee and I pay them a little bit more money and as, as you say you divide it all it could skew the numbers a bit so I would put that in and it gives you a breakdown of absolutely everything because like you've got to think of things like when a service based you've got to think about resource use utilization so m me tra like doing the rule of thirds the problem is is I'm giving myself a hundred percent utilization like you're never a hundred percent utilization. You can yeah, be exactly. in some days, but you know that there's times where you get up and you have a coffee and you maybe like you meet somebody and you chat to somebody in the coffee shop and then you come back to work. So you shouldn't really be giving yourself. You should be like 60, 75 percent like utilization that you should be charging yourself on, and you need to factor that into your your pricing and your cost as well. And then you need to kind of factor in anything like for staff when it's pricing. Is there going to be bonuses on, or is, is there going to be any benefits? We'll put percentages on for that, and then actually work out what your markup is on that as well. So is your markup any from ten percent to fifty percent? Like what? What is I that? that. To, so that you can then get your margin on it, um, because if you don't price right, you can literally just be working, you know, for no for no money. Like you can just. Are you break even, or you're barely even. breaking even? No. But that, that's you kind of touched on that at the start, where you said some people don't realise that that's why that's happening. So let's see if you're not profitable. So like this, there's this kind of concept that's like osmosis in this industry and mm -hmm. other industries as well where they go, oh, you're not supposed to make a profit for the first three years. And you're like, well, who wrote that rule? <laughs> that is a bullshit rule. <laughs> Whoever told you that, slap them. That is wrong. That is wrong. They're not, wait, you know, you should are they be in business? <laughs> if you can, be profitable for yeah. month one. If you can. And if yeah. you can, I get it. Like, I wouldn't beat yourself up if you're thinking, no, it took me five months to start tracking a profit yeah. and it was a bit kind of sketchy there for a while. I get it. There's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Don't don't beat yourself up if that's the reality. But don't go into the business mm -hmm. thinking, I'll take a loss for three years because you'll start to delude yourself thinking yeah. that's normal. 
just to clarify, that is not normal. You should be trying to be profitable for day one. I think that's good for the listeners to kind of hear that. The second thing is you said something there that was really interesting, which is, but you don't have a team, and I know you don't have a team. Um, so I wanted to kind of give just a bit of advice for the listeners if you're in that scenario. If you think about it, what would you have done if you got really busy? You would have probably went to a freelancer or you know maybe hired a person. So you need to think about, like from day one, you're a company, not a freelancer. So like your ambition is to build a company. So therefore, when they say, oh, I know it's just you, it's a team, you say, no, no, I do have a team. This is my team. And then you've just, I would actually throw in all the freelancers mm-hmm. uh, that you're working with because you're thinking, I'm giving them consistent money. Mm-hmm. So right now, my team is three people. There's me, a CTO, and a front-end developer. Mm-hmm. However, I know that I'm giving at least probably the equivalent of another two or three salaries to contractors and consultants to kind of expand mm-hmm. the team's capability. So for all intents and purposes, you could say the team was six. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good way of th- think about the common objections you get so that when people ask you or put pressure on your price, mm-hmm. that they do it. So yep. when I started out, you know, I think it was quite outrageous to charge 90 for a one-man band. Like I'd only just started my company. But it was interesting hearing what clients said. So they actually went, oh, we are working with this agency in a local area to me. And they said, oh, they're £60 per hour. You're £90 per hour. But I didn't say anything. I didn't jump in to defend myself. I didn't do anything like that. I just sat in silence. You know, and that power of silence and a negotiation and a sale was powerful. So the client says, but of course you're a specialist. I know that you have specialist knowledge in e-commerce or software. And I says, well, yeah, it could be that, but it also could just be that my team's more expensive. Mm-hmm. So how much did they pay for the resources? There's, there's lots of reasons. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't just put it down to specialism, mm-hmm. even though that is a good reason. Because, um, you know, I talk to other agency owners and I'm like, right, how much do you pay your developers? And what I pay my engineers versus what I know they pay their engineers, of course there's going to be a gulf of difference. Mm. My resources cost almost three times what theirs cost. But comparatively speaking, you go, they're the same. Yeah. You know, apples for apples. Yeah. Um, but I just think that's two really good techniques people yeah. can use when they get those kind of challenges. Yeah, because like, as you pointed out, I definitely made mistakes in pricing and it probably is. It's like you are a company you're offering a certain value just because I was a one man band doesn't mean that I'm actually going to give a crap service I'm still going to probably give a a good as or better service than some of these other people Um, that's why you built a business that's why like I did this in the first place Um, so I definitely had made mistakes and it it was generally just you know through through knowledge and some you know people will out there will try to get a deal you know you know especially in scotland <laughs> we're all looking it's not just scotland's you know, we're all no, looking every, for a deal. Like, name me one country where somebody yeah. doesn't like a deal but then um i remember the the difference was um i remember like thinking i've got quite a high price just now you know in scott you know scotland i was like probably trying to negotiate with some people and they were you know taking a little bit of a time and they were umming and oh and then like not sure and then i got a client down in london and she says, send me, ju- just send me the price over just now. I'm going to get it signed off by the managing director. And then I s- sent it over and she went, is that all? <laughs> and it was like, and John, I'm not did, kidding. Did, did on. you cry that night? And John, I'm not kidding. I, on. I, went, I went really high. I went high. <laughs> well, I thought it was high. I thought, right, this is high. This is the highest I've ever went. And she said, is that all? And I was like, wow. I mean, and see if I had in my head, how much would you, would you, have, would you have paid you know, like, what is the value to you? Like, what mm. was the value of your, your pricing? Because that's that's essentially, you know, if we talk about it, like, value-based pricing, they probably see this as going to be a massive value to it, right? So you should probably be tra- charging on value-based pricing rather than charging, like, when you think that you're, you know, you're lower and you've got the imposter syndrome and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it. it's quite difficult to bring um, value-based pricing into the market, mm-hmm. so... A lot of people, business owners, are not used to seeing pricing based on that. Mm-hmm. I, like, I think it's a really powerful technique, but when you're kind of in a competition, like what we do for a living, you know, you walk into any networking event and say, who designs websites here? You're going to get a lot of hands. It's quite a saturated market. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all off on the same thing. Their process is the same. Of course, they're not. Um, you know, the people out there doing budget websites, there's people there doing Wix websites and Squarespace, yeah. you know, as if it's like a full blown sales yeah. website. But when you kind of look at it that way, you're thinking, right, what is that value-based pricing? And I guess just defining it for the audience as well is, 
if they're looking for something, so it's like, right, what are you trying to achieve? Right, I'm trying to um, raise three hundred thousand pounds selling jewelry or whatever yeah. happens to be. Okay, so what's the kind of thinking then? So how are we going to get there? Right, we're going to have to put budget aside for marketing because we have to promote what we build. We're probably going to need either landing pages or a website or an app or some way of rendering that coin. Mm-hmm. Um, so how much would be reasonable, do you think, for me to put £300,000 in your bank, what would you pay to gain that? Yeah. Right? And then straight away they're kind of like then sort of ring fencing and saying, I will probably at least 10% of that you thought you said yeah I, I would have probably thought so about 10% of that so if you're wanting to do 300,000 you're going to have to be prepared to basically put in like 30 grand mm. at least um, however that's a 100% like a 10x on your money what type of investments do you make where you put a thousand pounds in and get a 10 times amplifier on that money and then when they start to think about it they go it doesn't sound rational anymore mm-hmm. And it's, it's exact to that kind of way. And you say, well, could we start smaller? Mm-hmm. You know, like, could we do something that's like, look, why don't we do something at 30K, but we try and get you like a like a three times growth mm-hmm. or something that seems a bit more achievable. And it's almost like trying to come to an agreement with them in a sense of like they've formed that pricing. The problem I have with it, and I think it's a solid strategy and it does work, especially if you have power and leverage in the market. Mm-hmm. But if you're then doing that and then someone like me or otherwise is kind of coming in and saying, ah, yeah, but you don't need to do that. You could just literally do this and this and this and this and it'd be a package deal and you do this and you do that. So I've made it really personalized, bespoke package to them. And it's like, this guy's a hundred grand. This guy is 48 grand. He's got like a full Mm -hmm. strategy, all kind of like what it is. This guy has that as well, but it's like more of the cost. And really it comes down to, am I comparing the same things here? who they I believe is going to win that mm-hmm. that fight you know what I mean like you're, you're basically backing a bet it's mm-hmm. a punt as they would call it yep. um, and I think it is difficult I've, I've personally not used value based pricing although I've read a lot about it and I respect people that do it mm-hmm. but I can almost tell when it's been done to me you know that way like yeah. you ever felt that when somebody negotiates and you're like I can tell that they're trying to manipulate or yeah. manoeuvre or yeah. you know you can feel like the conversation like changes and you're like Wait, I kind of feel like I'm now a piece on a board being pushed yeah. about, and I'm like, well, where is this conversation leading? Yeah. And then probably about five, ten, fifteen minutes before we get to the, the ask, I'm already like, right, guards up, <laughs> you know, like kind of defensive shield, you know, like kind of right, go for it. Yeah. And then the guy's like, so what do you think? Do you want to sign up? And you go, I'll talk to my business partner about it. Yeah. <laughs> or like kind of, oh, I'll check the funding and see yeah. if we can do yeah. it. You know, I've I've seen one as in guys in America I think they're called the Blueprint or something Blueprint Agency ah, Blueprint. And, yeah, and, and, and they do like a value based pricing but they do it on a a point based system and the reason why they do it is like me and you would be a should be a higher rate you know we shouldn't be a probably a £75 per hour or £90 per hour rate we should probably be 150 200 because what we can actually bring is a lot more strategic oh, more amplification and, and, and on and the amplification. Yeah. whereas probably you know the staff members should be probably a little bit less and i think that's why they bring they bring the point systems in because it's almost like a rate card of like if you you know are wanting this person that's what you're going to be like you're going to be paying more because there's more more value to it to yep. the person makes sense um but then also with like value based pricing just like the, the perception of pricing so we well, I love Apple. You probably don't love Apple as much. No, I don't you know, dislike them. But you, I don't but buy the product. But you, but I like the but you know that it's, it's a higher price for the so brand. The, for the brand, so yep. people all perceive that it's better. Like, and we talk about jewelers like Rolex, Breitling. Yeah, they're all. You know, you're all going. I would. You know, it's a higher price. It's obviously going to be a better product. Well, even that way with a Rolex, how long does a Rolex take to build? Do you know roughly? I don't know. I don't so it actually know. takes a year to build it. So when you think about it, a year's labour suddenly 35 grand doesn't seem uh, that much <laughs> and you're like probably more than one guy worked on it yeah so it's like actually it's probably uh, quite cheap it's pro- uh, in comparison to what it is what now it is. the reality is that brand might be manufacturing a lot of that through automation yeah. and then telling you it's been handmade yeah um that's not me having a dig at rolex yeah. but you know there could be efficiencies in there because yeah. let's say i used to do um website audits like a scan mm-hmm. kind of like it's different to the video audits i'm doing now but i used to do like a scan and I worked out it would take a human being about 23 minutes to do it mm-hmm. but you could write a, like an algorithm to do it in seconds mm-hmm. but then what do you do with the pricing mm-hmm. do you charge the client based on seconds or do you charge the client based on how long it takes because if you remove a time task and you don't keep the rate well there's no benefit to you then as a mm-hmm. company so why did you automate it mm-hmm. 
you know, like to get uh-huh. faster, but you didn't actually get the benefit. And I think it's the same with us as a senior. You forget actually how fast you'll do something. Yeah. So you and me doing a task, I could do something half an hour that maybe would take somebody else three hours yeah. because they're kind of, you know, it happened to me quite recently where it's like, I said, that's not really design, that's curation. So you're looking for somebody to like think about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And I, that's not meant as a diss to somebody that's doing the work. But when you're looking at it, you're going, does that commercially make sense to do it like that? Mm-hmm. No, it doesn't. So I'm going to go back to the client and say, I get what you're trying to do here, but I don't think that this is going to work because I mm-hmm. think that we should try this instead. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. And then it's like, right, and then they do the work. So not only is the work done faster, but there's like additional layers of advice because you've been down that path. Yeah. Whereas a staff member, there's a high risk or degree of risk that they'll go, guy asked for a blue circle. So I've delivered the blue circle. And you're like, yeah. So I would have actually said that you don't even need a shape, that it should have been text uh-huh. or a video or audio. And it's like, I bet didn't ask for that. And I'm like, I get that, but you're not an order taker. We're consultants. We're uh-huh. meant to be given advice to say, what's the goal behind that? Why, yeah. why, why do you think a blue circle over other methods is mm-hmm. better? And then if you believe the guy's rationale, then by all means draw on that. Mm-hmm. But again, we don't price for that. So that kind of like, you think about it, if you do it six times faster, mm-hmm. if you had like say two times the rate, let's so say they're 75 and you're 150, mm-hmm. that is actually reasonable, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean, for the, the kind of difference. Mm-hmm. But I think it's quite difficult to kind of wrap a customer's head around, well, how does this work? And mm-hmm. you can tell that a lot of agencies don't do it. Um, I actually conducted like research on agencies where I actually like went mystery shopping and mm-hmm. gathered the prices as well. This, yeah. Um, that was quite intense, but it was also quite eye-opening. Like the speed of what it took them to reply, the quality of the proposals, the pricing was all over the place, the way it was delivered, the processes were all different. Left hand's not talking to the right hand. Some have got developers. And I, I was looking at it thinking, you know, I could probably save these agencies hundreds of thousands of pounds because there's tons of inefficiency in the way mm-hmm. they're quoting. Um, but you're thinking, that's what my clients are dealing with. Mm-hmm. Every time my clients reach out to like one, two, three agencies, that's what they're getting back. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a company in Dubai we worked with, like right at the start of our business, and I actually had the conversation with the guy, a video audit, sat down with him, done his pricing, done his proposal, closed it, got started the project, and was a week in before the next agency yeah. even replied to him. I remember you saying that. He said that. seven yeah. people we reached out to, you were one of the only ones that replied to us, and then I asked them like a couple of weeks in, and they says no, about four of them have still not replied. <laughs> and they were all yeah. well-established agencies. We're talking about you know, the who's who of Glasgow agencies, and mm-hmm. you're thinking, is that arrogance? Is that no yeah. time? Is it, you know, bad resource? I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm actually genuinely not sure, but I think how damaging is that? Mm-hmm. How do you know that that's not the deal that yeah. takes your company to the yeah, next, next level? level. Yeah. And funnily enough, I did something similar as a project. Um, I was looking to do a new service, like a telemarketing service, and you would think with a telemarketing service that they would be really good. You know, you're, so I was like leaving inquiries and you think they would be on it because it's That's like true, a, yeah. it's a business development and it was like people never get back and I'm having to chase them and chase them and I'm like this is a bad sign this is a bad sign um, but it is interesting it's interesting to see what their process is and what they kind of perceive and how they do it so it's, it's probably one for a, another day when kind of talking oh, about try how, to talk how, about how, how you kind of talk like, for me let's see that speed of it like I'll actually try and yeah. communicate as soon as I can yeah. like I, I got a lead the other day there and it came in and I'd reply to her email within an hour and then I phoned her within like five minutes after that I was just oh like so fast uh-huh. like, I says well look you've reached out to me I appreciate yeah. it we have the chat got what she wanted and then she's like I was going to give her a quote there and then and then she's like oh I've got a specification oh even better so she sent me the spec I read it that night had full notes a full spreadsheet done that so she had all the pricing everything she wanted all the problems mm-hmm. looked at like literally less than 24 hours so when she reached out now that's not scalable mm-hmm. but for where we're at and stuff like that it's very doable yeah. and I think it, it plays well into the way I like to conduct the service because mm-hmm. you're thinking if you're on the ball and you're a good communicator then that's what the client has to look forward to yeah. whereas if I'm like kind of I always look at it as see if they're not good at sales and keeping them in touch with you with the sale they're going to be terrible at giving you support Exactly. because if they're not interested in taking money into their company they're certainly not going to be interested in taking problems into their company yeah. to go yeah. oh that Mark's project didn't go quite right there yeah. so let's let's kind of sort yeah. it out you know one of the things I was going to pick up then when you were talking before was like the when we were talking about the perceptions of pricing and things like that as well and 
you know, if it's a high price. I remember you talking about one of the ones as well when it comes to like price and objections and the like that. Oh, that you know that is quite a high price. And you're the, you're turn around and go like that. Is it? That's you're the first person that's ever said yeah, that. I, that. <laughs> so I, I should probably credit where that came from, but um, <laughs> it was me. No, I'm kidding. So uh, I read a lot of books. I watch a lot of seminars. I'm interested in sales. Yeah. So um, it's a guy called Andy Bounds, uh-huh. and it's a brilliant technique, right? But it's basically like uh, you know we are one forty an hour on page you go say or uh-huh. something like that. Um, you know we're not now with th- yeah. we've reduced it slightly for COVID and whatever to try and help. But let's say it's one forty, and they go oh, one forty. That's ridiculous. You know that other agency quoted me fifty bucks, right? Yeah. So his thing is like you just pause and you say like that. That's really interesting. You know, like they go, "Are oh, you really expensive?" And you go, "That's really interesting. I've never heard that before. What makes you think that?" And it like pushes it back to them like a tenants game. Like right yeah. now, you have to explain to me why you think that. And they go, "Oh yeah, well they're they're fifty pounds." You go, "Oh okay. What what is have you got their proposal? Maybe it's not apples for apples." And when you see it, I mean, it's very easy for me to look at it and say, "Right." I had a guy, again, who will remain nameless, um, we're certainly not going to do business together just because they were poles apart on price, but he was like, oh, I was quoted £250 for a website, and I thought, oh my and, God. Right, and he was raging, like he was actually disgusted that it was £250, and I thought, how, how much is your day rate, just out of interest, right, and he's like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 250 a day, I'm like, right, cool, so by your own rationale, you think that a website takes less than a day's labour? That, now that's using your pricing, not using the industry pricing. And he's like, ah, I, well, I mean, how long is it taking? And I says, well, do you have all your content together? So we could probably spend two weeks just gathering your content and writing your content. Or are you writing all the content? Are you a content expert? Uh, uh, well, well, no, I, but I could write, well, you could write it, okay. So design, design takes, say, three days. So that's 750, just going off your own rates. Um, and then it's like, what about development? You know, if it took three days to design, it might take six days to develop. So that's nine days now. And then probably we need some project management, 20% for that. But testing, we want to test it, don't we? We want to make sure it works on mobiles. How many devices do you think there is in the world? And he's like, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred. Like, we'll try, try more like 10,000. There's more than 10,000 devices that are there yeah. in tablets that way. There's all different systems, Apple, PC, uh, Windows, iOS, Android, Windows phones, you know, lots of things, PDAs, televisions, PlayStation 4. When I done the um, interview, the head of design at uh, STB, they had like 30, I think it was like 36 points of where this mm-hmm. website had to be fed, the STB player, mm-hmm. and that's what they tested on, but that's not the full range of devices. And I was like, so already I've got to something like 30 days of work. So that's 30 times 250, so that's mm-hmm. seven and a half grand. Yeah. And you think 250 is expensive. Do you know what I mean? But it's like, to me, it was like quite shocking, like quite profound. Like, how? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but even more so, I'm like, how does the agency do it for Aye. that? Even as a freelancer, I couldn't Aye. do it. Is that? As people just don't understand, do they? they what's involved? Yeah, they don't understand. And I think there's, a, there's, there's websites out there that are really, really, really cheap because you're getting like kind of cheaper labour, but they don't understand what they're going to get because lots of people will just take a templated website give me your content over, I'll add into a templated website, but it's exactly the same as like a million other websites that are out there. And yeah, fair fair play if you want to get that, but you're going to get zero success. It's a wasted it's a wasted project because uh. you're not going to get found for SEO. Nobody's going to engage in it because it's actually crap. <laughs> uh. You know, so like, what was the point in doing the project? You're trying to get business and leads. I may as well keep the money yeah. and say, right, well. See if you want a static website, you want just set up a Facebook. You know, make your Facebook your, your website if you want to do that. Um, if you're not wanting to actually have a website that's actually going to get you any leads in business, then, yeah, people just don't understand with pricing sometimes. But, yeah, we're kind of coming to the, the end a little bit here anyway. So what is your business better for today? So business better for me would be, before you start quoting clients, think about what the objections are going to be. Think about how you've rationalised your price and how you've justified that price so you mm-hmm. know how that price has been formed. Asking yourself questions like, what is my labor cost? How much profit do I want to take? What's my gross profit and my net profit so I can work out what costs have I actually got? And making sure that every job is covering. So if you know you need to buy extra tools or equipment or um, specific licenses, make sure there's a bit of budget, not profit, but there's a bit of budget that's assigned to that. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of setting yourself up to one, be profitable, but also so you're set up for growth. 
every time you land a client, it should be a celebration. It should be a the company just got that little bit bigger, that little bit more secure. The wages could potentially go up. Your wages could go up. The company can grow. You could maybe you know progress the kind of strategy that you're trying to build for the company. Mm-hmm. Because if you're not thinking like that, by default, you're probably going to end up in survival mode. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be like, kind of, oh, you know, they've, like, it doesn't matter what you are. You could be £15 an hour. Trust me, you're mm-hmm. going to meet people that think that's expensive. Yeah. So ignore that and focus on what type of client do you want? What's a fair budget for what you're doing? Mm-hmm. And then just charge that and the yeah. rest of it. Just follow that away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my business builder would be make sure you do your research and understand uh, what your actual costs are and make sure that you're adding up the markup on that cost and pricing changes as well. So make sure that the pricing changes as you know the world goes on, inflation increases, all this sort of stuff happens. You can actually increase your price as time goes on. Um, and believe in your price, because when we talk again about pricing objections, the, the worst people is, is they don't trust themselves to be pricing high or at the right rate. And that's when the pricing objections happen and they go, oh, well, oh, charge a little bit less or charge a little bit less you know your price you know that's going to you're going to break even or you're going to make a certain amount of markup at that price then you just say that's the price if you don't want to pay it then great you can go on and there's going to be another supplier like you know shake hands and go away but you need to you know be set exactly where your price is so that would be my business betters so do you want to wrap us up there john yeah no no problem so it's another episode of Business Builders. Today we were talking about how to set your prices, how we come up with those numbers. If you're enjoying this type of content, please remember to follow, engage, like, follow. Make sure you leave us a comment as well. Um, although me and Mark are busy, we always do like to read those comments and we like to see what people are getting you know, good information from. We've asked a few times now, we've had people reaching out to suggesting topics that we cover here on the podcast. And we want to make sure that that keeps happening. Do you want to learn more about business? setting prices, marketing strategies, getting into the kind of nuts and bolts of it. What's the type of content that you want to watch? Because we want to build it around you, the audience. So until next week, it's a goodbye from me. And it's a goodbye from him. See you later, guys.